You may be seated. Well, today we're cruising right along in Lesson 7 in Revelation Chapter 5. Now, bear with me for just a few minutes because we want to take a step back and think about this glimpse of heaven. As we've seen the seven churches that God promised eternal victory to those who were overcomers. But in order to be an overcomer, we are going under, right? is something's happening that we need to overcome. So we realize that we, we are engaged in a spiritual battle. Sometimes we don't always recognize it. Sometimes we don't always realize the spiritual battle that we are all engaged in. But the fact is, every single one of us has a spiritual battle going on over our souls. We are in spiritual warfare. And we've seen this as we've gone on Wednesday nights learning about Job. We saw um, the enemy's tactic as in Job 1, it says that he, um, Satan is going to and fro all over the world just to see if he can find someone, as Peter said, to see, as he's roaring like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. And in Job 1.8, we see that because God had protection over Job, Satan had to get permission from God. And I don't know about you, but that is so comforting to know that God is the one that is sovereign over our lives. Yes, Satan is trying to rip us off, but God's always there with his hand on us. In in fact, in uh, Luke twenty two thirty one, we see that Satan or Jesus told Peter that Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But Jesus says, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. So God's purpose, Jesus' purpose in allowing the spiritual battle to take place is to refine our faith. We've looked at that in past studies. And if you feel like Satan is trying to sift you, chances are he is. How many of you feel like that? today. Oh good, I'm not alone. Sorry, but we're in good company. Job said, though he slay me, still I will follow. And that's what God's spirit enables us to be able to do. As we know that there is an eternal weight of glory that awaits us that's not even worth being compared to this temporal time that we're in. We're told in Ezekiel 28 that Satan was an anointed cherub, perfect in all of his ways until iniquity filled his heart. Satan, along with a third of his angels, fell from heaven. They were kicked out of heaven because of their pride, according to Isaiah 14. And unfortunately, they try to take as many people down with them as possible. Yet, we are so blessed as we look at John. Remember, it was because of his faith in Christ. And when John was dipped in boiling oil, persecuted, trying to, and they were trying to martyr him for his faith. And when that didn't kill him, then they exiled him to the island of Patmos. And he was a prisoner. He was away from all of his friends and his fellow disciples. He was probably at the lowest point of his life physically. But I love it because that's when God met him. That's when we see the goodness and mercy of God in his life. And that's when God gives him a glimpse of the throne of God where the angels and the church are bowing down before him and worshiping, crying out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And I just love that picture of how God takes us in our lowest moments and he refreshes us right when we need it, right when we think, God, I can't take it anymore. He says, okay, well, let me give you a little grace. But in the meantime, it's good to be prepared to know that we're in a spiritual battle and that these things will happen. Knowing ahead of time that Satan is doing all that he can to rip our faith from us, to try to rip us off, try to get us off course. And, and it's through trials, troubles, and hardships. In other words, there's a war going on in the spiritual realm. Now, because this life is a battlefield, and it is, it produces affliction deep wounds, and sometimes lifelong hardships. There's no battle in a war zone that doesn't produce casualties. But because we have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb, we have overcome and we do not lose heart. As we walk by faith, we allow God and his spirit to come in and fill us as we allow him on his rightful place on the throne as we crawl down off of it. So, 
This battle as that we are in as it pertains to our study today is ultimately because of the fall of Adam and Eve, which we've seen. When sin entered the world, God gave the title deed over to Satan. And now Satan is referred to the God of this age, the prince of the power of the air. He has free reign to go to and fro throughout this world. Yet the good news we see today is that the cross has redeemed us and the time is drawing close for God to take ownership once again. And that's the point. And with that in mind, we continue to see a glimpse of heaven for each one of us while we're in this battle. It will be over one day on this earth and we will be with him in victory, secure in his arms for eternity. And that brings us to chapter five. Last week we began to see the glimpse of heaven as it centered and revolved around the throne of God as that was the key word. And that reflected his glory, his power, his majesty, and his, the surety of his promises. And now as we move into chapter five, again, at this point, the church has been raptured. All the saints are there in heaven with the angels bowing down before the throne, worshiping he who alone is worthy. And this week, just as uh, in chapter four, the word throne was key to the passage, today in chapter five, there's much more revealed as the key word scroll is used 11 times throughout the book of Revelation and eight times here in this chapter alone. So as we continue to see this vision heaven of heaven, our studies entitled, He Has Prevailed. And I say, praise God for that. In chapter five, John continues in verse one saying, and I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, the scroll, um, on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So as we see the one who is on the throne, John moves from describing the essence of Jesus as being like a jasper and sardis stone in chapter four to an actual physical attribute of God Almighty, not figuratively, but literally. The scroll, which we will look at in a moment, was in the right hand of God as he was on the throne in heaven. And so this represents him holding all things in his hand. Now, what a great picture for you and I is his right hand represents strength. It represents security and salvation. And that is awesome for us because we are secure in his right hand. It's a demonstration of his glory, his majesty, his goodness, his faithfulness to his promises. And that's encouraging for us. As God says in Isaiah 41.10, that we are to fear not for I am with you. Do, be not dismayed for I am your God and I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Look up verses on the right hand of God and you will be so blessed as that how it pertains to you and I today. So we too are held in his right hand, meaning that no one nor any thing shall ever snatch us out of his hand or separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That's how we are more than conquerors through the battle that we're in today. And that brings us to what we see in his hand, and that's the scroll itself. As we said, Adam and Eve forfeited the title deed of the earth over to Satan through sin. So the scroll is believed to be the title deed of the earth, which contains the requirements of redemption. It's the cost of redeeming the earth is the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other payment. Now, while Jesus has already paid the redemption price, he has not yet taken possession of the earth. And as we see his judgments during the tribulation, this is a process which by which he will take possession of the earth. In other words, while Jesus already has a victory over Satan and sin, it will not be fully realized until he comes back to claim his authority over the world at his second coming. And in the meantime, we see the seven seals on the scroll. Now, the unsealing of the scroll speaks of the seven years of tribulation, as known as uh, the 70th week of Daniel from Daniel chapter 9, Jacob's trouble. Um, and during that time, we as believers are with 
Jesus. And I praise God for that because that is our hope. It's truly our hope as we know that God is merciful. He is loving and he has not appointed his people to wrath. And that brings us to what is written on the scroll. What is written on the scroll? We're told that it has writing on both sides. In other words, it's full. There's no room to add anything. It's complete. It contains everything as it pertains to God's plan for mankind. And here in Revelation 5, the time has come for the seals on the scroll to be loosed. So what Isaiah, what Ezekiel, what Daniel only knew in part through their vision is about to be revealed to John. John gets a more complete vision, and then he relates it to us. And remember, it's a vision of what is to come. So one day we will all actually witness these seals being loose. This is something that we will witness in the future. And I love that. I love getting the sneak peek preview. I don't like surprises. So we aren't going to be fully surprised. We get to have a sneak peek today. And that leads us to where um, the number two, what we see are the seven seals on the scroll. Now we see throughout scripture that seven is the number of completion. Again, meaning that it is complete. And each time a seal is broken, more information is revealed about the judgments that will come upon a Christ rejecting world, a God rejecting world, a Elohim rejecting world. The, one of the leaders said that God rejecting is just too vague. We've got to be Jesus Christ. And I said, how about Elohim rejecting world, the gospel rejecting world? We'll just talk about all of it because there is only one God. And this is what it's talking about. Well, it takes us back to Jeremiah 32. We know from Rome, the Roman scrolls that have been found in archaeological digs during biblical times that they had seven seals. And this is how it shows us how it worked. You see, this, the, the scroll was rolled up, but the seal secured the document. And the only person with the authority to break the scroll or break the seals could do it. And here we see that it's only Jesus because he alone has authority over the title deed of the earth. And as John tells us, it was a double-sided scroll with seven seals. This same uh, scroll was mentioned in Daniel 12, 4, as well as Ezekiel chapter 2, where we get a bit more insight to the scroll. In Ezekiel 2, 9, it says, now when we look when I looked, there was a hand stretched out to me, and behold, a scroll of the book was in it. Then he spread it out before me, and there was writing on the inside and on the outside, and written on it were lamentations and mournings and woe. Meaning next week in Revelation 6, we are going to begin to actually see what was written, which are lamentations, mourning, and woe. And it fits perfectly. In other words, judgment is going to be revealed as we unroll the scroll. Then number three, we see who is worthy to open the scroll back in Revelation 5, 2. John says that then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? So John's attention is drawn to this strong angel. He has a loud voice, possibly the angel Gabriel, as he is mentioned in scripture, um, saying that he was standing in the presence of God. And here we see that this strong angel who is worthy, uh, he asks, who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? And the answer is found in verse 3. Verse 3 says, and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able. No one was worthy, neither the angels nor the church, the 24 elders, to open the scroll or to look at it even. Then verse 4, so I, John, wept much, meaning that he lamented and he was deeply grieved to the point of tears because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Now, this verse was my 
uh, my takeaway this week. It really ministered to me, and I found it very interesting because we know that John, his view is of heaven and all the worship and the glory around the throne, the holiness of God, and he, he, he who sits upon the throne, representing all authority, all power over all things. I mean, John was in the presence of the throne of God. So he knew, he understood what he was witnessing. He knew that the angels and the elders were falling down and worshiping before he who alone was worthy. Yet his focus, his focus turned from the throne of God to the unworthiness of man and angels around him. And what happens? He falls apart. He weeps in deep grief because it seems as though no one is found worthy to open the scroll. You see, John had a limited perspective. He still fully didn't get it as he saw the unworthiness of the men and angels. And as I thought about that, I thought, what a lesson for us today. I am so prone to getting my eyes off the throne of God, the, of the one who alone is worthy to be seated upon the throne, the one alone who is worthy to have power and authority over all things and get my eyes on people, on circumstances, and on things around me. And you know, when that happens, the enemy is winning He's getting our focus off because he wants us to drown. He wants us to take. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Just this week, a godly woman that I've been attending church with for probably 25 years, she was part of the Bible study for years, took her life. And it's because she got her eyes. I don't know why, but I do know it's because she got her eyes off of the majesty of God. The fact that God is on the throne and he is able to get us through whatever it is that he allows. As Satan has to ask permission to allow these things into our lives. And it just goes to show we never know with the person sitting next to us what's going on. We never know. Thus the importance of fellowship, friendship, centered on the word of God, the edification of the saints, pointing one another back to the worthiness of the throne of God because he alone is worthy. So too it is with us when we get our focus on the people and circumstances, we fall apart in despair. And I for sure am an expert to that. But, when the, tr but the truth is when we are in this flesh, we will lament over things because we're human and we see with our physical eyes. Yet we can choose to turn our focus back upon that throne, fully knowing that God's in control. He is working and he will work in a moment. Have you ever noticed that you can be in the depths of despair and the minute you turn to the Lord and you fully, fully put your gaze upon him, everything changes, though nothing has really changed. But everything has changed because our focus is right. Immediately, we can see that he alone is worthy. And that's what Jesus is going to do here. Another interesting thing is that in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 21, 4, it says that when we get to heaven, that God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. So here we are. John is in heaven, right? And we see that he's crying. Even though he's witnessing the glory of God and his majesty, he's grieved in his spirit. And so as we think about that, I was thinking, how can that be? And I don't know if this is right or not, so you can take it or leave it. But as I thought about the context of Revelation 7 and the context of Re uh, Revelation 21, it's speaking of after the tribulation period. It'll be when we are in the in with him or at the end of the seven-year period in the millennial kingdom and then through the future. And in Revelation 21, at the end of time, we will be dwelling in the new heaven, in the new Jerusalem, where all the battles, all the judgments will cease. And I have to believe that maybe when we're in heaven during the tribulation, we may be like John as we look around and see all the judgments poured out. How could we not grieve when we see so many in the world being destroyed as they have rejected Jesus Christ? 
As we read of what is to come with the blood being filled up to the horse's bridle in the valley of Armageddon, how could we not weep bitterly? So as I thought about that, I thought, for me, that was a neat perspective that there will be no more crying and no more pain and no more sorrow once we are done with the battle and we will dwell with God for all of eternity. And what a hope that is. Well, back to Revelation 5 and verse 5, as we continue to see who is worthy. As John is deeply grieved, he says, but one of the elders, another man who was redeemed by the blood, said to me, do not weep, behold, or turn back from focusing on the unworthiness of others and pay close attention. Focus on, and here we see the first title for Jesus, focus on the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, who alone has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. So we see the answer to who can open the scroll as he's described as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And this is referenced from Genesis 49.9, saying that Judah is a lion's whelp or a young one. He bows down, he lies down a, as a lion, and as a lion, who shall rouse him? And it was prophesied that the scepter would not depart from Judah, as one of the elders calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. John would have been reminded of this in Isaiah 31.4, where it says, As a lion roars and a young lion over his prey, when a multitude of shepherds, or maybe kings, is summoned against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor disturbed by their noise. So the Lord of hosts will come down to fight from Mount Zion and for its hill. In other words, Judah is described as a lion lying in wait. He's like a mighty roaring beast ready to pounce on the enemies of God and shred them into pieces. That's who our Jesus is. And then the second description is the root of David. And this is, comes from Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, where it says that there shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Jesse was David's father. And a branch shall grow out of its roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him in the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So the Messiah Jesus Christ is the branch of David coming out of the line of David, yet he's also the root of the line of David, meaning that he's the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, as we have seen. He is eternal. And then in verse 6, we continue to see who can open the scroll where John says, and I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, which were the angels, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God or the seven angels sent out into all the earth. So Jesus is described not only as the lion of the tribe of Judah, not only as the root of Jesse, but also right here as the lamb. The lamb is mentioned 28 times throughout Revelation, so it is a key title for Jesus. And only Jesus Christ can be described as powerful as a lion and at the same time as gentle and loving as a lamb that was slain. And this points back to Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy 9 where we see the Passover lamb was killed. You guys all know the story at Passover when the children of Israel and the plagues came upon him and the death angel was coming and uh, the blood was put on the doorstop, the, the lintel and the doorpost um, to atone for the sins of the people so that the death angel would pass over. And it was a picture of the perfect spotless lamb of God that would be slain for our sins on our behalf to redeem you and I so that it would pass over. So it, re it reminds us that Jesus is the Passover lamb, simply meaning that there is no salvation or eternal life apart from his shed blood. Now, when he saw the lamb as though it had been slain or slaughtered, that points to the fact that his wounds may possibly still be seen when we get to heaven. Have you ever thought of that? It says that he was marred more than any man. He was marred beyond 
visage. It was amazing what had happened to Jesus. Possibly we will see where the crown of thorns were beaten into his skull and, and have those holes where they were. It's possible that we'll see where the nails were driven into his hands and his feet or where the spear was thrust through his side. All because he's the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. It's possible, but we do know what John records in John 20, in verses 25 to 29, when Jesus appeared after his resurrection. He had been crucified, he had gone to the lower parts of the earth, and he came back to walk with the disciples for a period of time. And the disciples said, we have seen the Lord, but Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put in my, my finger into the print of those nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, Jesus came the, and the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So it is very possible, it seems, that, that we will see the, that he is the Lamb of God as though he has been slain, is sacrificed for our sins. So I believe at this point, Jesus saw the Lamb as though it had been slain, meaning that Jesus is alive. You see, he hadn't been fully slain because he's not dead. He rose again. And John saw him standing because the de death could not hold him. The grave could not keep him. And because he lives, we too have the hope of living forever with him. And so John continues to describe the lamb in verse, lamb in verse 6, saying that the lamb has seven horns. Now again, we've seen that the number seven stands for completion. And the horns represent power and authority. And the seven horns most likely stand for complete power and complete authority. Then he describes the lamb as having the seven eyes, which means simply that he is all seeing. We've pointed out in past studies that his name is El Roe. He is the God who sees everything. He sees perfectly and they and as he sees everyone as they are and because he sees all that means that he knows all so jesus is the lamb of god he is the one in complete power complete knowledge completely omnipotent and omniscient now remember this is john who was jesus's disciple this was john who referred to himself as the one that jesus loved and upon seeing Jesus as the lamb, as though he were slain, no doubt he would have flashed back to the times that he walked so closely with Jesus. Times when Jesus corrected him. Times when Jesus encouraged him. Times that they ate together. Times of intimacy in the upper room when Jesus washed his feet and instructed them to do as he had done following his example. Times when John witnessed him being beaten and crucified and the time when John was one of the first at the tomb to see his resurrected body had, had raised from the dead, fulfilling his promise. And then he watched now the scene in heaven. And so here John says, it's Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of Jesse. He is the lamb. And while Jesus came the first time as the lamb to lay down his life, the next time he comes, he will be fully seen as the lion of the tribe of Judah as he comes to pounce on the enemy and shred them to pieces. And he alone is the one that is worthy to open the seals. Well, back to verse 7 where we see John's tears and grief turn to rejoicing in verse 7. As he says, then he, Jesus, came and took the scroll out of the right hand of God who sat on the throne. And in verse 8, when Jesus had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And how beautiful it is to know that as Jesus takes the scroll out of God's hand, that all worship turned to the lamb. 
the four living creatures, the 24 elders now are falling down before the Lamb of God who was slain, showing that the Lamb of God is God because he is Elohim. And just like the scene that John saw, when we get to heaven, we too will respond in complete and perfect submission to the Lamb. And today, we can choose to do that as well. We can choose to desire to submit. And as we saw last week, unfortunately, our flesh keeps crawling back up on the throne. But w- and while we are in this flesh, we will be engaged in that spiritual battle, so that spiritual tearing back and forth. But as we desire it, we know that God will work in us both to will and to do. And one day when the battle ceases, and I can't wait for that, the enemy will never accuse us again. The enemy will never lie about us again or lie to us again. He'll never be able to bother us again. So when we get to heaven, no more flesh, no more battling the enemy. Instead, we'll be in joyful submission to the Lamb of God. And then in verse 8, we see that as John sees the angels and the redeemed, he saw each one having a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Since the saints or the church is in heaven at this time, this is probably speaking of the prayers of the tribulation saints mentioned again when we get to Revelation chapter 8. And what a beautiful thought that not one of our prayers goes unnoticed. Do you ever feel like sometimes you pray the same thing over and over and over and over again and you're like, God, are you listening? Yet God is listening because he hears, he sees, he knows all things. And what a beautiful thought that our prayers are like incense and they're being stored up in heaven. And I love that. And not only that, but Psalm 56, 8 tells us that God keeps all of our tears in a bottle. What a neat thought, huh? Not one tear falls that God doesn't take notice of. Well, then not only did they fall down before the lamb, worshiping with instruments, but they worshiped in verse 9 as the redeemed as by singing a new or fresh song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people and nation. So again, Jesus alone is worthy to open the scroll and it's because he not only redeemed us, but also he redeemed the world just as he promised. And in verse 10, he has made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth for a thousand years in that millennial kingdom, referring back to the introduction in Revelation 1, 5, and 6. Heavenly worship will be fresh. All new songs, all new heart, all new spirit. No more flesh, no more tears, no more sorrow. Isn't that gonna be beautiful? In unison, we will all be worshiping together the one who alone is worthy to open the scroll. Well, back in 11, John says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, over millions, innumerable in other words, saying with a loud voice, recognizing for all time that worthy is the Lamb, Jesus, who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessings. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea, all that are in them, in other words, everyone, I heard them saying blessings and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. Beautiful, beautiful worship that we get to look forward to. True, perfect heavenly worship. We're not going to be thinking about what we want to go eat. We're not going to be thinking about what so-and-so said to me, or I'm so upset about this, or we're not going to be thinking and having this, this double-mindedness. It's going to be purely all for and about Jesus. As we're before the throne, we will be so overwhelmed with his presence as the worthy one. And again, millions. I love going to the Win Leaders Lead Conference because there's over a thousand women there and they're all women that want to be in ministry. So when the worship starts, it's like, oh, 
hallelujah. I mean, it's amazing because everybody is singing at the top of their lungs and, and there's just something about being in a huge group of women that are just singing at the top of their lungs. And I thought of that as much as I love that, it's only a thousand. This is millions. And it's going to be in purity. It's going to be in unit. And we'll probably all have really good voices. That is like going to be heaven for sure. It's not fair. Most of my family can sing and I don't. I said, I am so good. I gave it all. Everybody. <laughs> I left none for myself. But millions before the throne, worshiping with instruments and all the voices singing in unison, blessing his name, giving honor to his name who is worthy. And that is what happens when we finally get off our thrones and put God in his rightful place. And you know, we can start right now. We can start with that attitude of worship. This is November, Thanksgiving month. And so it's so nice to take that step back and say, God, forgive me for being unthankful. We're so thankful. Yeah, this is going on. Yeah, this is going on. But God, we're so thankful. We're redeemed for all of eternity. And if that's all we've got to be thankful for, that's amazing. We're redeemed for all of eternity. Thankful for his mercy, his grace, his love that he had for me. In that while I was still in my sin, Christ died for me. That's amazing. Thankful that his promises are true. They're sure and they will come to pass. Oh, the grace of God that saved a sinner like me. So just thankful we belong to Jesus. Our existence is about so much more than our personal happiness and ease in this temporal life. It's about God fitting us for eternity. It's about God preparing us to worship with those millions in unity. According to John 14, Jesus said that he has gone ahead and he's preparing a place for each one of us in heaven. And one day he's gonna come and get us and it's going to be immediate. It's coming soon. But in the meantime, we've given, he gives us the ability for us to overcome as we abide in him. And I pray that we would all be strengthened by the power of his might, no matter what's going on in your life today, no matter how hard the enemy is roaring around you. He has no teeth because Jesus has stopped him in his tracks. Jesus is allowing it to refine you and to let your faith shine that's more precious than gold. Well, next week in Revelation 6 and 7, we're going to see that the Lamb begins opening the first six seals and the judgments will begin. So hold on tight. It's heavy and it, it's, it's going to get real next week as we see what's going to happen to a Elohim rejecting world, <laughs> to a God rejecting world. And I can't tell you, if you don't know God and if you've rejected him, today is the day. Don't let another day go. And maybe you've been in church forever and you're cruising right along, but you love holding on to the things that are on the throne. You want to be on the throne. I'm here to tell you, you don't belong there. And it's a miserable place to be. Just surrender over and re recognize that God is on the throne. And nothing in this life is so despairingly, disparagingly bad enough that we should throw in the towel because we don't know more than God. God knows more than we do. So trust him. His promises are true. He is faithful. And we're going to see next week that that's even written on his side. Or maybe the, week, the next week after that, I don't remember. But John 2, as he was invited to come and see, that's what we are. We're, we're invited to come and see. Ask God for spiritual eyes so you can see what it is that he wants to show you. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and praise you for your word. God, we thank you for this heavenly vision of this worship that is just beyond, I don't know, Lord, I just, we just so look forward to it. But God, in the meantime, as you are fitting us for it, Lord, I just pray that we would abide in you, that we would be strengthened by the power of your might as we abide in your spirit, asking for a fresh filling of your spirit every day so that we would be able to live our lives according to your plan and give up ours. So God, we just ask for your mercy. We pray for your grace to just be poured out upon us today as we fellowship centered around this vision of heaven and just the lamb who is worthy. 
We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand and close with a song.